Thank you very much indeed, Professor Gross, for this marvelous talk that spoke us about the beauty of the physics. And speaking about beauty, we are, of course, uh, reaching the point that has to do with Professor Jeannie Yoon, who is the award winner of the Leonardo da Vinci Prize. And I would like to call here Professor Nuno Grande and invite him to introduce, uh, to introduce us, uh, Professor Jenny. Thank you very much. Well, after this fascinating and infinity philosophical lecture by Professor David Gross on dark matter and quantum matter, we have now the lecture about what's the matter. And this lecture will be addressed, as said, by Professor Meijin Yoon, who received her Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University in 1995 and a Master of Architecture in Urban Design from the Harvard University Graduate School of Design in 1997. She is currently the Gail and Ira Drucker Dean of College of Architecture, Art and Planning at Cornell University and co-founding partner of Howler and Yoon. An architect, designer, and educator, Yoon is committed to advancing creative and critical practice and ped pedagogies, scholarship, and research to address the many urgent environmental and social challenges we face in our cities and communities. Yoon's design research, research, Yoon's design research examines intersections between architecture urbanism, technology, and the public realm. Yoon's body of work includes cultural and institutional buildings and public spaces, such as the Memorial of the Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia, the Collier Memorial at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the Moongate Bridge in the Shanghai Expo Park. Current professional projects include the Institute of Democracy at UVA, the MIT Museum, and the Living Village at the Yale Divinity School. Yoon's work has, widely, has been widely exhibited both nationally and internationally at venues such as at the, modern, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, the Vitra Design Museum, and the National Art Center in Japan, among others. She is co-author of the recent title, Verify in Field, Projects and Conversations, Howler and Yoon, and Public Works, Unsolicited Small Projects for the Big Dig of 2009. And she is also the author of Absence, an artist book published by Printed Matter at the Whitney Museum of Art in 2003. Meijin Yoon has been also honored and with several prizes, and among, among others, in 2021, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters in the field of architecture, the highest recognition of artistic merit in the United States. And this year, 2022, she will, tomorrow, receive the World Cultural Council Leonardo da Vinci World Award of Arts. It's an honor for our university to uh, give stage to this award tomorrow at Sala dos Capelos, the main honorable room of our university. But we are also very honored to have her here today and listen to her interesting lecture about what really matters in architecture. Jun, please. Great. Um, so thank you so much um, to the World Cultural Council, to the University of Coimbra, uh, and thank you to all of you who are still here for your stamina um, today. Um, so I'm going to give a talk called What's the Matter? 
And um, what's the matter is, in a way, uh, uh, opportunity to take stock of the moment. In doing so, it asks not only what's the matter, but what matters, and how do architects and designers build, create, or enable what matters? If we survey the present, we find ourselves in an awkward moment where everything we had been taught about social distancing and the pandemic has shifted, and we're back in person, sometimes remote, um, and we're finding we have to relearn what it means to be social. Pre-pandemic, we had already experienced the saturation of technologies in our public realm. Uh, every interaction, every encounter was already mediated. And we live in a planetary and interconnected age, a moment created by both a superabundance of information and connectivity, and at the same time, an unprecedented amount of uncertainty, where the age of information coincides with the age of post-truth and fake news. Today, in many countries, we feel politically more and more divided, and we've collectively witnessed the fragility of our institutions and the fragility of democracy alongside the resilience of intolerance and hate. We have also seen the erosion of women's rights and human rights globally, and we see violence, destruction, and tragedy, both in the Ukraine and many other parts of the world. And at the same time, we're grappling with the legacies of violence, forced dispossession, enslavement, colonization, and racism, both in the United States and other parts of the world. And in addition to all of these deep social, economic, and political questions of our time, we're, admits, we're in the midst of a climate catastrophe where 100-year storms and devastating fires occur with greater and greater frequency. So what can architecture do in the face of these daunting, layered challenges? Um, as designers, we're stewards of the built environment. And where do we have agency and how do we take action to build a better world? When the Eameses were asked to define design, Charles Eames responded that design is an expression of purpose and a method of action. When asked what are the boundaries of design, his rhetorical response was, what are the boundaries of problems? So purpose, action, and problems define design, and we have a lot of problems. They're multi-layered, they're complex, and in the US we would call them wicked problems. So how do we reimagine how we teach, learn, and practice to prepare us for the present and our future world? And I'd like to use this lens of purpose, action, and problems, and our pedagogical models to think through this and highlight a few institutional contexts uh, and my own intersections with them as both an educator and practitioner. The first universities and schools of architecture were not institutions or places as we've come to understand them today, but really a collection, a collection of faculty and of practices, practices we now refer to as pedagogy, the literal method and practice of teaching. MIT, the first school of architecture in the US, literally began as a collection of books and artifacts and the pedagogical practices we know today as the studio and the thesis. And in the wake of the Second World War, MIT moved to consolidate its position as a leader in the scientific and technological realms, building on both its military research and its industrial partnerships. Almost in tandem, however, Questions of computing, visual communication, human interaction found their way into MIT, creating an early culture of collaboration between art, science, and technology. The artist Georgi Kepish was hired by the Department of Architecture to create and teach a radically new set of drawing courses influenced by the scientific discoveries of the time. 
So this long-standing relationship at MIT between the visual arts, computing, and building technology was my own context as a young faculty member. The relationship between building discourse and testing to failure frames a particular practice around a research model. A research model that is about testing and hands-on learning, learning by doing at one-to-one -one scale, and the first project I want to share is born out of this context um, and is also born out of tragedy. So the Collier Memorial at MIT honors uh, campus officer Sean Collier, who was shot and killed following the wake of the Boston Marathon bombing by the Tsarnaev brothers during their um, escape uh, during the manhunt. The city and the campus community were shaken uh, by this bombing following this act of terrorism. And there was a mixture of grief and anger and fear. The city and community came together around the concept of Boston Strong and MIT Strong. And I was asked to design a memorial uh, to honor Sean's life and service. And you know, the whole time I was questioning myself about what this means to be strong. And some wanted a national symbol, like an American flag. Others uh, wanted to find a way to bring a kind of uniquely MIT um, uh, ethos to the project, this notion of hand and mind. Uh, so the final co concept oscillates between, I, I would say, a few meanings. It's a five-pointed figure. It could be a star. It could be a hand. It consists of five walls, um, but an absence um, that is made present, uh, which creates this sheltering space to reflect um, this loss, this loss of Sean Collier. In also thinking about this term, strong, um, where does strength come from? And um, I wanted to bring the notion that strength comes from unity, uh, from many individual people coming together to support each other and to literally hold each other up. Um, I wanted the memorial to be quite literal about this. It's composed of 32 massive granite blocks that stack one on each other using just gravity to create a compressive structure that supports a massive dome. So essentially it's five half arches leaning in to support each other um, and then suspends this very, very shallow dome. And uh, this conception of this project would not have been possible without um, two doctoral dissertations and a colleague of mine uh, at MIT at the time, Professor John Oxendorf. And the project brought together multiple engineers, both in academia and in practice, to essentially figure out if it was possible for these 32 massive blocks to support each other without tricks, tension cables, uh, et cetera, and to resurrect a kind of old building technology the ancient uh, vault. Um, the blocks are carved out of a domestic quarry in the United States. This is the keystone block, so you can see how massive each of these blocks are. Um, and uh, we use giant saws to cut, cut the blocks, and we use very advanced robotic CNC machining to um, uh, fabricate each and every one of these unique blocks. Now, the robotic fabrication was critical because there was this question or debate among the engineers around whether it was possible to actually create a fully compressive structure, not theoretically in the computer, but in the physical world, because um, uh, there was essentially two millimeters of tolerance uh, where the forces needed to uh, transfer to the next block. And if we were two millimeters off, which is infinitesimal <laughs> in construction technology, though not uh, compared to physics, um, that the um, horizontal 
um, uh, blocks could drop as much as four to seven inches. So that was, you know, essentially catastrophic failure if we were not absolutely precise. But with my faith in technology, I said, well, we have robotic carving, we have digital models, we're going to be able to hit two millimeters. And the fabricator said, but, but how will you be able to calculate the erosion of the blade as you are milling the blocks? And so indeed, as every block came off the uh, robotic saws, we measured every one, and of course, they are not precise. And so each block had to be adjusted uh, computationally before it was fabricated once we knew the dimension of its preceding block. And this is how this was installed um, on MIT's campus. And it was installed on top of a scaffold so that we could perform the test to ensure that the forces uh, went into the legs of the memorial. Uh, and we put strain gauges between every single one of the joints. We have students climbing all over the memorial uh, so that um, uh, we could monitor if the physical memorial was behaving as predicted. And so the scaffold sat on these ginormous, gigantic scales. And as the masons lowered the scaffold, literally millimeter at a time, so that the forces in the blocks would gradually move into the legs. After an excruciating five hours of moving this uh, micrometers at a time uh, and calculating this, indeed, uh, the engineers were correct and the vault uh, is suspended in air just through the physics of, of the blocks. And so the project exists as this memorial uh, for contemplation, um, for remembrance. There's uh, this kind of incredible everydayness to the way the memorial sits on campus um, uh, for small, small groups to gather. Uh, and it continues to be tested uh, even <laughs> uh, uh, even, in, um, even in the present, uh, recently tested when a car with great force uh, hit one of these legs and uh, the blocks thankfully stayed suspended uh, in air. And so I do think this notion in the discipline of architecture of hands-on learning uh, is really, really critical. These are some of the students who engaged in the project and did theses around it uh, as well. So um, this kind of hands-on learning, I think, is fundamental to the pedagogical mode of the discipline of architecture. Now, um, there's a famous statistician, George Box, and he famously quipped, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, so I'd like to continue on our journey of pedagogical models. Um, in 1951, at the University of Texas in Austin, uh, the uh, School of Architecture became a point of convergence where innovations in architecture pedagogy were cohering around a set of principles that recast architectural education in North America. Uh, and the faculty included John Haydick, Colin Rowe, Bob Slutsky, among others, and they would become known as the Texas Rangers. They had a famous nine square grid problem, which became the framework of teaching design studios aligned with a kind of emerging formalism, where the plasticity of forms was decoupled from structural and material necessities. It was a kind of abstraction and formalism. Uh, and the Texas Rangers formed this network of pedagogical influence that would extend to the Cooper Union, Cornell University, Syracuse, John Haydick became the dean of Cooper Union, and Colin Rowe became a seminal professor and fixture at Cornell University who had influenced generations of architects and educators. And when I arrived at Cornell as a student, the nine square grid problem was alive and well uh, and, and essentially foundational to our education. Um, 
And this emphasis on formalism, abstraction, representation, you know, you can see in other uh, alumni work like Peter Eisenman, this is Peter Eisenman's House 2 project, where he embraced this term cardboard architecture as a mode of working that was intentionally disengaged from the material tectonic and constructional basis of architecture. And here, this is a photograph of the actual built house, House 2, um, but the photograph is taken and doctored to make the house look as close to the cardboard model as possible. So if we fast forward to today, uh, the context that generated the nine square grid problem feels very, very distant. Today, there is no architecture without social, political, material, and environmental consequences. Two recent books map out contemporary theory around uh, climate change and our discipline. The first with the focus on performance uh, energy uh, and operational energy, and then the second with the focus on embodied energy. So in Kiel Moe's recent book on the Seagram's building, he argues that the building represents an object instance, a temporary configuration of materials within a much larger flow of materials and labor. And Moe's analysis of the Seagram's building um, essentially accounts for every single material used in the building and it highlights the urgent need to account for the extractive nature uh, of architecture, what it takes to produce, refine, ship, install, demolish, and dispose of materials, um, both in terms of construction ecologies and carbon footprint. Um, so whether we're building with local materials, um, such as in our Sky Quartz project here in Chengdu, China, um, in this project, we really wanted to think about the local material and crafts. So this is all built with local um, bricks. It's a massive um, cultural building. Uh, and what you're seeing is the bricks get darker as they go up, and that is not part of the design. It's just the uh, bricks that were being manufactured locally just got darker uh, as the um, building continued to uh, be erected. The project is built on this kind of Chinese courtyard typology, so we could use a lot of cross ventilation and not overload the mechanical uh, systems. But I think what's um, uh, really uh, critical about this building was it really understood the brick as this kind of one person's labor. So the idea of the brick is you one, um, Mason can basically build a whole building one brick at a time because it's scaled to the human hand. Uh, so um, we thought in the building we could conceptualize each brick to have a kind of orientation such that all the bricks along, all the bricks would always face uh, true north-south or true east-west regardless of the angles of the building. And this uh, creates on the oblique angles of the building this uh, incredible brick texture. Uh, so when two oblique corners come together, it looks something like this. And it creates a kind of texture that I think is only possible um, uh, on that site, in that place, uh, at that time. Uh, in contrast, if we look at a recent project in Boston, this is uh, a, a multi-family housing building, which is made out of precast concrete panels. Um, here, um, the building sits very, very close to the Boston Commons, um, but the site was too skinny uh, uh, to be developed for a very long time. So it was essentially a small parking lot in the middle uh, of the city, and it, um, uh, bordered a very historic, lovely neighborhood called Bay Village, uh, which had this um, beautiful context of materials from bricks to stonework to limestone. Uh, and so as we conceptualize this multifamily high-rise building, it's 20 stories, the easiest way to build this building, of course, is uh, steel and glass. Glass curtain wall is among the cheapest and fastest materials. That's why you see it so prevalent. Um, but we wanted to give the uh, project 
material thickness uh, within this context of the neighborhood and imagined in the kind of first studies we did these kind of fluted uh, limestone uh, panels. Uh, we mocked this up in the shop we have near the studio uh, out of foam uh, and then we um, went through the process of, process of trying to be very efficient with the number of molds we would make to create this fluted texture um, on the building. Uh, but we learned actually that uh, the molds were not driving the construction cost and we have a, a um, really excellent precast uh, manufacturers um, near Boston. Uh, but we learned that it was actually the construction crane that would drive the cost of the building in terms of material time, uh, labor time, uh, and so that became the driving uh, factor. The amount of time and the number of picks the, uh, the crane would have to make uh, around a concrete panel. So we learned it wasn't about the efficiency of uh, fewer molds creating cost efficiency, but really the limiting the amount of uh, number of panels. And so this was an important kind of lesson that allowed us to create a series of very unique uh, panel geometries that create this texture to the building within the context of historic Boston. And when these panels come down to the ground, um, they act you know, as much as columns as they do as uh, panels. So um, whether we're building with brick or precast, I think what's important that we acknowledge now um, as seen in this drawing by Gray Organsky is um, uh, this chart essentially compares the embodied energy of various building materials and timber is the only low energy renewable resource in building construction. Um, so when we were asked to do a um, installation in Spokane, Washington, we wanted to work with mass timber uh, because of um, embodied energy. The installation essentially is two bleacher forms that allow you to look out over a beautiful park in Spokane, Washington. And if you look at the kind of historic um, uh, wood shops uh, and wood benches, this is what, what you would normally uh, see in kind of our inherited timber construction. Now, um, what you will see is a kind of industrialization of mass timber, um, basically not limiting to the scale of the tree itself, but creating laminated um, members at a kind of industrial scale. What we wanted to do for this installation, though, was not privilege the kind of flat industrialization of timber materials for mass uh, fabrication, but really work with the uniqueness of uh, the timber itself using the kind of five axes of the robotics to maximize that uh, to um, create this form. Uh, and uh, especially in the context of Washington State uh, in the US, the Pacific Northwest has this long history of uh, forestry and increasingly sustainable forestry. Um, so here's the installation, it's still under construction. Um, so when we uh, build, whether it's with brick or precast or um, mass timber, the materials um, we use, we consider very much the embodied carbon and the labor and the thought, uh, and there's a lot of thoughtfulness that goes into uh, thinking through that material context. Furthermore, as we um, focus on energy and the environment, our models have shifted, I would say, from um, uh, the kind of uh, simulacra, so the one-to-one -one scale model or the cardboard model, uh, to really thinking of simulation as a form of modeling um, that helps us look at the specificity of local environmental context to think about um, our changing climate. 
Uh, we recently completed this urban uh, public community amenity structure uh, in Shenzhen. The design brief, though, mandated transparency in the structure um, to make it feel very safe for the public to be there. But um, this is in a very hot, uh, humid climate in Shenzhen. So you can see that here in the middle. And if you look at the um, amount of solar exposure during the day, it would be incredibly uncomfortable, I think, and would require a lot of mechanical um, uh, energy in order to cool the space. And so we looked at um, uh, some wonderful precedents. This is FISAC's Hydrographic Studies Center, which uses these very beautifully shaped louvers to bring in uh, light. Um, and we uh, thought maybe there's a way we could control the geometry of the canopy so we could create a super canopy that would shade, self-shade, uh, the building, the community structure. And we work with these simulation tools that enabled us to really refine the geometry so that it was minimum amount of material that would maximally <laughs> block the heat gain but um, allow for uh, indirect light uh, to bounce into the space. So light without the heat. Uh, and so these were uh, extruded aluminum custom extrusions. They provide this canopy. And here you can see, we also want to see the trees as a canopy too that will grow uh, through this canopy structure to create um, this kind of microclimate uh, for this community structure. Um, we're also doing some research um, about uh, climate adaptation and equity. And um, I think what is very apparent uh, today is that with climate change, um, the effects will be disproportionately felt, not only globally, but within communities and cities uh, themselves. Um, so uh, uh, computation and data are enabling us to see these inequities uh, in our built environment. In my lab at Cornell, the Design Across Scales lab, we're looking at publicly available LIDAR data. data. This is essentially highly specific 3D scans of cities. Um, and we're using this high resolution data to analyze the street tree as a kind of urban infrastructure that can mitigate heat island effect. Um, and looking closely at how inequitably distributed this urban amenity, the tree, is uh, in different communities. And we're working with colleagues at Cornell Tech to help develop a digital tool that takes this LIDAR data and allows people to see um, their own tree canopy infrastructure in their neighborhoods, but also compare that across uh, neighborhoods for uh, city agencies and uh, parks departments. And here you can see just the extreme difference in the um, amount of tree planting in certain neighborhoods versus others. So um, I think these digital tools are gonna be um, transformative, especially as they become more and more understood as a form of civic data. Um, so I wanted to um, conclude with two projects. One is talking about the city. So cities are actually on the front line of climate change and the world has actually never been more urban. Over half the people um, on the planet currently live in cities and by 2050 this is expected to grow to 70 percent. Um, and we know cities uh, are where 80 percent of the global GDP is produced. Uh, and they remain economic engines and social and cultural hubs, but they also consume 78% of the world's energy and produce 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So as cities around the world continue to grow, so do those compounding um, urban and environmental challenges. So this project um, is uh, in Shanghai, it's on the site of the former 
World Expo site. Um, so this was many years ago, but this site was a former industrial site that they transformed for the um, Shanghai Expo. A series of national pavilions um, were built and people visited them. And then, you know, after a few weeks, the expo was over and there were these giant elephants across this um, urban landscape. So this gives you a sense of the scale of just a third of the Shanghai Expo site. Um, and we were asked, uh, actually we competed, we entered a competition to look at um, uh, uh, some bridges that would bring the public to this transformation of this hardscape of the World Expo site into a kind of central park for Shanghai, which would bring basically like Central Park in New York, the lungs of the city uh, to, to the public. Um, so our project is this tiny installation, what looks tiny in plan, but it's probably one of the largest uh, projects we have done, um, uh, which is the kind of pedestrian bridge to this beautiful new cultural expo park. So it's actually in the upper right, you can see um, this bridge. And um, part of the competition brief, we said it was actually the competition was to design two bridges. And we said, oh, well, instead of the two bridges that connect A to B in the most expedient way, maybe we could conceptualize it as one bridge with a hole in it, um, as opposed to uh, two linear elements. It's really seen as a kind of plaza with cutouts that frame the water. Um, so these are photographs very recent. Um, the project is completing construction. As you can see, Shanghai was in lockdown during this photo and there's very few people out to enjoy this amazing new park. Um, but what was important to us was to create a bridge with balconies that you could actually appreciate this new urban ecology. Um, and that the bridge would be not a place just to cross, but a place to linger. Uh, and then from one bridge, there's a dialogue with the other bridge and uh, hopefully a new way of imagining uh, the city in, um, uh, in, in the future. So the last project I wanna share takes us to the University of Virginia. So, uh, and I wanted to talk about academic institutions and their incompleteness, but a kind of positive, I would say, incompleteness. The University of Virginia is heralded for embodying the ideals associated with American higher education and American democracy. Founded by Thomas Jefferson, signer of the Declaration of Independence, the third president of the United States, and the architect of the University of Virginia and an owner of over 600 enslaved men, women, and children during his lifetime. So this uh, is Thomas Jefferson, and uh, this is the historical marker at UVA that tells the history of UVA with no mention of slavery. The first official recognition of this hidden history was in the form of an expression of regret uh, issued by the UVA Board of Visitors in 2007. And a plaque was installed near the rotunda. And this plaque had the unintended consequence of sparking outrage among students at UVA. They were outraged by the limits of this recognition. It was small, it was, you know, underfoot. Um, and again, even the text, in honor of several hundred women and men, both free and enslaved, whose labor between 1817 and 1826 helped to realize Thomas Jefferson's design for the University of Virginia. It again privileged uh, Thomas uh, Jefferson. Um, so, uh, um, a series of faculty and students came together um, and started a community action group for racial equity. And one of the students, in, one of the student interns, Ishraga Etahir, um, 
actually um, proposed a student competition called the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers uh, 10 years before this memorial project would ever begin. Um, and I think we credit a lot to Ishraga's uh, efforts and activism. That same year, the UVA president commissioned um, the commission, the University Commission on Slavery. Uh, and that's when our design team um, was asked to lead the process and design the memorial. Um, the team consisted of Eric, my partner, Eto, um, an amazing artist, Mabel Wilson, Frank Dukes, Greg Bleem. Um, and we worked to uh, create a design process that would engage the community um, in these questions around what the memorial should be. And it's very seldom that you are given uh, enough time to do a full community engagement process um, where you withhold designing yourself. You are there just to listen. Uh, and many of those conversations were really uh, powerful and uh, moving. And so the design process, we had to design the design process to foreground dialogue um, uh, with the members of the community, but also uh, the descendant community of the enslaved. Uh, and then we were also given this opportunity to test multiple sites. Um, there was no program, there was no budget, there was no site given. It was really more a kind of searching uh, than a kind of solving uh, kind of design problem. And what we um, heard was that the memorial had to be a space that brought dignity to uh, those who we were remembering and honoring, and that this, the memorial had to be a space in and of itself uh, for the community of the present to learn from the past, to advance and commemorate a landscape for racial justice today. Um, the memorial had to, of course, negotiate a very prominent site uh, located very close to the rotunda. And in fact, we use the rotunda as a kind of um, uh, entity to have a dialogue with because the memorial is the same diameter as the rotunda, but instead of being enclosed and axial, uh, the memorial is actually um, open, conical, and on a tangent, um, but they are both 80 feet in diameter, but just very different in uh, experience and it's nestled into this landscape with these two uh, intersecting conical geometries to manipulate your horizon line so that when you walk into the memorial it's not intimidating it's very very low but the landscape tips down just as the walls uh, begin to rise and envelop you so um, it consists of a series of rings um, inspired by the ring shout, um, which was a ritualistic dance or the coming together in a circle as a community. And there are multiple surf surfaces of the memorial. And what we wanted to make sure is uh, to create a sense of safety for the community um, that would be coming to the memorial. Um, the sense of section, so because the landscape is, is sloped, the outer ring is a different height uh, than the inner ring, but that every part of the memorial feels very human. Uh, it's based on the kind of human scale of what you can reach and what you can see uh, based on uh, your ground plane. So this is um, uh, the section uh, that calibrates it. We really wanted the outer surface and the inner surface to come to a point. Uh, and this is the mock-up, and then this is the final geometry uh, of the memorial. Um, the other thing that was really important uh, to the community and uh, to us as the design team was really to capture the kind of material legacy of the time. And we work with uh, Eto Otutigve, who's an artist who was captured by these kind of um, uh, tombstones that were unmarked 
uh, at the time um, of when uh, the enslaved were freed. Uh, and so we wanted to find a way to bring the kind of roughness uh, into uh, the memorial. We also love this work by Eto called Becoming Visible, where he looks at the kind of scarification um, of these um, uh, bronze sculptures, and he did his own self-portrait following the murder of Trayvon Martin um, uh, in a hoodie uh, to kind of capture um, using this kind of scar or streak to create a kind of three-dimensional perspective. And the one um, protagonist of the um, history around enslavement in Charlottesville is Isabella Givens. And she is the only enslaved person for whom we have a first and a last name. Uh, and we have her own words that describe her experience as an enslaved woman at the time. And so um, many of the descendants and many of the Charlottesville community wanted a physical representation of enslavement. Um, and uh, the memorial, as you see, is quite abstract. It represents coming together, it represents the ring shout, but it doesn't pictorialize any aspect of life of the enslaved. But this kept coming up in community meeting after community meeting, wanting either a bronze statue or um, some kind of literal representation of an enslaved person. So because we had this photograph, um, we thought one thing we could do is basically carve in her eyes into the memorial in such a way that it's not visible from every vantage point, but at a particular angle, in a particular light, these eyes of Isabella Gibbons pop and you can just see them at scale. And so she becomes a kind of watcher and a witness of the memorial. And then one of the um, really challenging aspects of the memorial was how to recognize um, the individuals that were enslaved. So historians estimate that were, there were approximately 4,000 enslaved who lived on campus between 1817 and 65. And the majority of them, their names are unknown. We know the first names of just over 500 community members, and only for a handful do we have a first and a last name. We thought it was important to share both what was known and what was unknown, um, which results in this kind of genealogical cloud of the community, which stretches across the inner surface of the memorial. And as you walk in, you become kind of enveloped by this genealogical cloud. And what we know are names and relationships, but we created these uh, marks, they're kind of gashes, and they stand as placeholders for um, uh, names that may be in the future uncovered or names that might never be known, but represent the life and um, uh, the um, uh, horror of enslavement and the loss of humanity of each one of those individuals. Um, and so this uh, shows uh, the memorial after it's rained. These memory marks, these gashes that carve into the stone, carve, um, they're like welts. They carve in, um, in deep into the stone in a kind of crescent-like way so that after it rains, the water is um, captured in these crescents just a little bit longer. Even though the stone surface around dries, the water then kind of bleeds down or uh, cries um, and gives the stone a kind of visceral uh, quality. Uh, one of the um, most important things that came out of the memorial was um, that UVA hired a genealogist um, whose job was to, be tr was to trace uh, the descendants of the enslaved names through the archives and through um, genealogy. Um, and uh, there were members of the descendant community who were uh, part of the design process. And 
uh, as I shared before, for us it was really critical to understand this memorial was ongoing and um, living. And this is a picture of five additional uh, um, ancestors who were discovered uh, during the design process. Uh, David Hearn, Fanny Hearn, Bonnie Castle Hearn, Lily Hearn, and Ben Snowden. Um, they were discovered um, uh, through the uh, research and design process and their names were carved in uh, after the memorial was uh, completed. So the memorial dedication did not happen in spring of 2020 as originally planned uh, because of COVID. Um, but it was amazing because just as the construction fences were removed, um, the UVA community and the Charlottesville community um, just flooded in and gathered there for a White Coats for Black Lives remembrance of the murder of George Floyd. And the whole community took a knee for approximately nine minutes in, um, as a reminder of the violence and injustices that persist in the wake of slavery. So um, the memorial um, opened just as the uh, city of Charlottesville and the cities of Richmond were removing their Confederate uh, monuments. And this unresolved legacy of Thomas Jefferson and the university was precisely the kind of opening that the white nationalists seized upon um, uh, for their march. And then this is the students in response um, uh, after. And I share this map of Confederate monuments. Here we see the trend for constructing Confederate war monuments did not follow the war. Uh, they did not follow immediately after the Civil War, but they were resurrected or erected during the Jim Crow era um, as a mark in public space uh, that furthered the Confederate narrative about who was welcome and not welcome in the public realm. So as our incomplete institutions evolve, uh, we need to learn from our history. We need to be actively expanding our histories and we need to do this through scholarship and collaboration across disciplines because in order to chart our future, we need to both deeply understand our past and our histories and our institutions um, and thus our agency to uh, contribute and uh, shape and build them. So um, one of the things I uh, really feel in my role as a dean of the College of Architecture, Art and Planning at Cornell is that you know to peer into the future you really just need to look like right outside the door um, and look at our students. Um, it's actually in this collection of people in our institutions, faculty and students, uh, and our collective pedagogical practices um, that has insights into the future um, and shares how important our um, academic educational institutions are in terms of the role and responsibility for prototyping that future. And I know that it's a future that will continue to advance equity and justice beyond the walls of the academy to produce uh, actionable knowledge to advance sustainability and resiliency, which sometimes means unbuilding, but more and more adapting, adaptive reuse, um, uh, in order to think about how we can build in entirely new ways and how we scale this knowledge to cities and communities while empowering imagination uh, and transforming that imagination into action. Um, our awareness of challenges we face as a society and as a planet have never been more urgent. And it's clear that designing the future will require our collective imagination and it will be a collective enterprise, um, not only to design for the changing world, but to design in a way that actually matters. 
So in closing the talk, I just wanted to end on the roof of Rand Hall at Cornell in 1952, when Buckminster Fuller um, taught a studio there and um, built this geodesic dome uh, with his architecture students, this 21-foot geodesic dome. And in um, 1968, Buckminster Fuller proposed a great logistics game, uh, an interactive anticipatory design tool that played out how to overcome energy scarcity and territorial politics um, through the redistribution of the world's resources. And his goal was to usher in a new era of resource consciousness and I quote, to make the world work for 100% of humanity through spontaneous uh, cooperation and without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. This was absolutely radical um, optimism, which uh, resonates today. And I'm gonna end with one last quote, and this is from Bell Hooks. And this is for my fellow um, professors and for the students. The classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind that allows us to face reality even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries and transgress. This is the education as the practice of freedom. Teaching to transgress, expanding our fields of possibility, and facing the realities and challenges of our time with this imagination and creativity is absolutely critical to designing the future and our society. Thank you. Thank you so much for this inspiring lecture. We have learned today uh, the polysemantics of the word matter. <laughs> Dark matter, quantic matter, black lives matter. And uh, this idea of matter as material, but also as a question, is very related with the, uh, let's say, the political and social sense of your work. Because as, as tiny, tiny it can be, there's always a kind of symbolic dimension in your installations, in your memorials. And this brings me back to the idea that we are, in fact, a political practice, a political profession, in a way. How do you deal with this, this idea that you are also making politics when you're, or, or thinking about politics when you design? Um, so I think, uh Peter Eisenman actually said there's no architecture outside politics. But um, I would say in the discipline, we're more and more aware how interconnected uh, everything is, right? And so I think architecture has always addressed social questions, cultural questions, and the politics kind of hovered outside. And uh, while, you know, um, I would say I, you know, my early career would not have said I'm a political architect. I think it is indeed true. There is no architecture. There's probably no life these days outside of politics. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really enjoyed about your work and about this idea of trying to heal society, especially in the United States with all this uh, looking back to history and try to heal some of the tragedies of the past and you are only 300 years old, we are more or less 3,000 years old. We are always discussing this also in Europe, how to heal this past of colonization, and slavery, uh, dictatorships. What I like about your work is that you're not proposing to erase anything or destroying anything. 
because in our Europe it would be a madness. We, are, we have so many episodes in history that we, we should erase through this uh, understanding. So what I like about your work is that you add something new, which will explain the suffering of the past. So your memorials do not want to erase the importance of the founder of the University of Virginia. You want to explain that there was something beyond this foundation and the memorial tries to dialogue with the, the rotunda of, of... So I think your, your proposal is not to erase or to destroy or to take statues out, but it is to, to add something that will try to explain what happened. Is it so? Um, I would say if any of the work is engaged in a dialogue with the history and the present, then that's an amazing success. Um, but one thing I've learned is more important than the physical artifact, like the physical memorial or the physical building, it's actually um, the process itself, like the design process that required the community engagement that allowed real dialogue to happen that informs, I would say, the thinking and the approach to the memorial, and then you know what other meanings it takes on after. I hope it will take on further me meaning and encourage more dialogue. But for me, what has been really incredible is actually the process uh, of conversation and dialogue and learning. I've learned so much, um, and maybe less the artifact itself. Uh, alguma pergunta? Any question? Uh, não sei se há outro microfone. Não? Se não? Ah, vem aí. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, I was wondering um, how you're incorporating neurodiversity access into your design, uh, especially in the light of the first uh, standards, which are very tentative, to many things wrong with them, but one thing right about them is that uh, they do include the requirement to avoid bright white backgrounds because it can cause fatal epilepsy attacks. So I was glad to see that was in there, although user involvement was terrible. <laughs> and internal British standards institution involvement was terrible. And I speak as someone who's on their accessibility committee, although I'm actually resident in uh, Coimbra, Portugal. Um, uh, and that first standard was published as publicly available specification in October of this year. So you can just uh, Google it and get it uh, uh, and download it. Uh, and I didn't notice any mention of the principles of universal design in your lecture or anything, uh, you know, even though it's in the UN Disability Convention uh, and it's well known. Um, so could you explain to me how you're incorporating it and in particular yeah. getting rid of um, the, these uh, noisy open plan environments, replacing the flexi plan or selling other things, and also having a look at best practice such as the Sir John Sir Museum in uh, London, England, uh, which was uh, finished in 1831. <laughs> I will do my best. It's actually very hard to hear from here um, on stage, so now I understand the other speakers who uh, also shared that. But I think your question was about neurodiverse populations and how they engage architecture, universal access, and... Um, well, it's, it's, it's applying universal design standards. Universal now, I mean, for example, in the Portuguese anti-discrimination law 2006, yes there's a requirement to proceed through universal design. The only problem is that 
almost nobody here understands it. I do, but there's probably about half, you know, more people understand, fewer than understand that than string theory yes. in this country. Well, I, I mean, um, uh, I think universal design is absolutely basic and fundamental. So um, uh, there is no way to build without universal access in the US and uh, receive a building permit. But there are meeting the code for universal access and then there are uh, really prioritizing all abilities to experience something with as much equity as possible. And that's what I think is true universal access and we absolutely believe in those principles. And so even the, the way the memorial slopes down ever so gradually uh, and how we uh, work with the radius and the horizon line absolutely had to uh, think about all all abilities um, uh, to move into that site. And I thought it was really interesting that you brought up neurodiversity. I feel like we're learning more and more of that, about that through, um, through research and uh, especially when we collaborate with acousticians and the like and uh, learning that everyone learns differently, everyone um, experiences space uh, differently, space and time, not in not in physics space way, time. but um, and I think these are informing and uh, changing the way designers practice, at least in okay. the United States. But given that this is only published 16th of October, the world's first standard of this type anywhere, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, I would just say we, we, we meet that it? we meet universal <laughs> design available, access so as a standard. So you can just download it for free. Thank you. Another question? Anyone? Get there. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to give us this talk. Um, I'd like to ask how important it is for the design process, how the building is going to age after the inauguration, and how the memory of the building is going to um, age as well. Yeah, you know, we were just discussing at lunch today, I think one of the most sustainable things we can do is to take care of our existing buildings. Um, adaptive reuse, um, really thinking of how old structures can be used uh, to address programmatic needs versus the automatic demolishing and reconstructing. Um, so uh, in that way, I, I really think we should not only appreciate our 100-year-old buildings, but also be designing so that our buildings can last and be used and adapted in the future for the next 100 years. That's the best thing we can do in terms of embodied energy and for a sustainable planet. Thank you. Another question? Another question? Oui. Uh, hello. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. I have a question. Do you believe that your work will be used as an inspiration for the future generation of architectures? Architects? <laughs> um, maybe I will just answer by saying that I've been inspired by past. Um, artists and architects and creative people, musicians, and uh, I hope that as a discipline, um, our kind of creative capacity continues to inspire not only the discipline, but the public at large. I think you're all very tired, so can I? <laughs> Can I just say thank you, um, thank you to everyone and thank you for everything today.